All right, everyone, I think we'll get started here. Um, thank you for joining us for our third Habs Harrier training workshop of 2021. Uh, I know for a lot of you, this is going to be review, uh, but a refresher is always good um, to remind yourself what Habs look like, how to collect samples, um, and how to transport them to the lab quickly for analysis. Also, what our Habs reporting system looks like so that you can know what the results mean and can help inform others too to understand the results of the lab analyses. So my name is Nathaniel Lawner. Uh, many of you know me as Nate though. I am the director of outreach here at CSI and I am also the Cayuga Lake Habs monitoring program coordinator. Um, so thank you again for joining me this afternoon. Um, I'm excited to announce that following the presentation Jennifer Tofano, who is the program associate at the Cuga Lake Watershed Network, will be giving a presentation on lake-friendly living and actions that you can take to uh, help protect the water quality of Cayuga Lake and hopefully even present, prevent harmful algal blooms from happening. So I see one or two new faces out there. So I think I will go through our whole presentation today. Um, but I'll move pretty quickly through some of the things that might be review for folks. Um, but I just wanna make sure I cover it all for everyone here. So what are harmful algal blooms? Now, many of you here are well aware that although they're commonly referred to as algae, these are actually not algae. They're single celled organisms called cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria are ancient organisms. They date back billions of years ago, and they are actually the oldest known oxygen producing organisms. So they were the first organisms to create our oxygen rich atmosphere. Um, and interestingly enough, some cyanobacteria actually evolved to become part of modern day plants. Um, so that kind of evolutionary process is what led to plants like trees and grass and things that we know today being able to photosynthesize. Um, they're a natural part of the aquatic community in lakes and ponds across the world, and even in oceans as well. Um, and they have a lot of really important biological functions like producing oxygen. Um, so they are a good part of our aquatic ecosystems, um, but as we'll talk about, their growth of their populations can often run away in this rapid growth that we call a bloom, um, and that's when they can start to become harmful. Um, so these cyanobacteria produce natural chemical compounds, and many of them we are still studying, and it's really kind of an emerging field of science. Uh, some scientists think that they use them to communicate, other scientists think that they use them for gene transfer or uh, to deter predation. Um, but what we do know is that a few of these chemical compounds are toxic to humans and other animals. And that's part of why we call these blooms harmful. Um, so you can see that there's many different taxa of cyanobacteria. Um, and on the right here are two microscopic pictures of two types of taxa that we have here in Cayuga Lake. So these pictures were actually taken using a microscope uh, from a bloom collected on Cayuga Lake in 2018. Uh, on the top here, we have what's called microcystis cyanobacteria. And this, this guy likes to grow in really uh, higher temperature waters. Um, and at least on Cayuga Lake, we're finding that microcystis is the one that seems to be primarily responsible for producing the microcystin toxin that we test for. Um, on the bottom here, we have a cyanobacteria called Dolichospermum. Um, and the really interesting thing about Dolichospermum is it's one of those cyanobacteria that can actually fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. So even if there's not enough nutrients in the water to facilitate its growth, it can grab those nutrients from the air um, and help itself grow that way. So blooms, when we talk about cyanobacteria blooms, what we're really talking about is either the rapid population growth of cyanobacteria or the accumulation of all these single cells to a localized area. 
Now, this is different than the natural seasonal growth that cyanobacteria undergo in a freshwater ecosystem. So on the right here is a really simplified chart of the seasonal succession of phytoplankton populations. Um, and cyanobacteria, you know, as it does photosynthesize, is a phytoplankton. Um, so you can see that the population of diatoms grows in the early spring, uh, followed by a population growth of green algae. And actually this, you know, will present itself. We get a lot of suspicious bloom reports in June and a lot of them are green algae related to that population rise. And then in the warmer months of the summer in July and August and September, the population of cyanobacteria naturally grows in a lake. Um, but again, this rise in population is lower than, it's much less than these uh, rapid kind of exponential population growth that we have that result into a bloom. Um, we don't know every factor that facilitates the formation of a bloom, um, but there is some consensus that warmer water temperatures seem to facilitate bloom growth, uh, that high concentrations of phosphorus and nitrogen in the water seem to really facilitate their growth, and that still calm and stratified waters also facilitate their growth because it allows those cyanobacteria to really capitalize on that warm layer of water at the top of a water body. Um, on the flip side though, we have had blooms that occur on windy days. Um, and we think that that might be because on days when there's prevailing winds going in one direction, it's actually accumulating all the cyanobacteria that are floating in the surface water to one specific shoreline. So those types of blooms are less about population growth and more about just the accumulation of these cells. Um, but these factors can be really lake specific and they can even vary within a lake. Um, and one interesting finding that your work is helping to show is that we have differences of bloom occurrence even within Cayuga Lake. So we're seeing differences between blooms that occur at the northern end of the lake, blooms that occur at the southern end, um, both in their microcystin toxin levels and also at what times of the summer they seem to occur. So that's really interesting to see as well. So um, I think many of you have seen this video, but I'm just gonna play it quickly for us. It's a great reminder um, and please unmute and give a shout out if you can't hear the audio or anything like that, but we'll just run through it quickly. This is a great video made by Dr. Rebecca Gorney at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And it's a great way just to refresh our memory of what a harmful algal bloom does and doesn't look like. Now we're gonna to transition to identification. First, we'll start with things that are not HAPs. These are the three categories that are most commonly um, suggested that people think they're HAPs and we have to explain they're not. Uh, filamentous green algae, duckweed or water meal, floating aquatic plant, uh, or pollen. And we'll go through pictures of all three. There are many different kinds of filamentous green algae. And the best rule of thumb for identifying that is if it looks like you could go out and scoop it up with a pitchfork, or if it's bubbling or silky or foamy, or not foamy, um, bubbly. I said that already, didn't I? Anyway, if, that's, if it looks like something you could grab out of the water, it's probably not a cyanobacteria have because remember we're talking about microscopic cells those don't have any structure they don't hold together and filamentous green algae often does this is a type that usually forms on the bottom of a uh, ponded water and again it can, you, you can touch it and stretch it and cyanobacteria will never form strings like that duckweed from a distance can look quite a bit like a harmful algal bloom it has that same neon green color, but it's just, um, they're floating. They're some of the smallest vascular plants and they're floating on the surface. And if you look at them closely, you can see the individual leaves. This is not microscopic. These are macroscopic individual plants that you can see. If you look closely, they actually have a little root on the underside. So they're very different than algae or bacteria. And uh, again, they're often mistaken for a hab. Pollen is also one that we get calls about every year, and uh, we can diagnose it pretty easily because it's usually in June. 
and we don't have very many harmful algal blooms in June, um, but pine pollen in particular is common at that time of year. I'll pause right here to say quickly that we have already had a number of suspicious bloom reports here on Cayuga Lake due to big pollen accumulations. So it can be a really common look-alike and it can look a lot like a hab. Um, but as she said, the big giveaways are the color, it's distinctly yellow, and they usually happen in June. It's usually very bright yellow and will form a surface scum like that, but it breaks up very easily. And uh, it's, it's just a matter of a few weeks. So now we'll switch to things that are harmful algal blooms. Unfortunately, harmful algal blooms can have a whole variety of appearances. There's not one quick rule. They can be green, blue, white, brown. Um, they can either be mixed into the entire water column or just floating on the surface. They can be impossible to see any distinction or they can form little clumps. So there's a lot of different characteristics, um, but I'll show you a bunch of pictures and then you'll know. Um, so they can look sometimes oily or like spilled paint that blue color is pretty diagnostic, but some people mistake it for petroleum products. Uh, but in this case, it's blue and green mixed together. Um, sometimes it's a bit more dull, like a pea soup, light green color, again, really mixed into the water there. Uh, here, this shows how it's really just right on the surface. So you can see here, it's just really the top layer of the water that it's floating. And here, some uh, logs are actually trapping some water. And that's pretty common. Anywhere where there's reduced flow and mixing is where it can accumulate and float up and be trapped. Um, but on a bigger water body in or, or in windy conditions, you can see it completely mixed into the water, where it's just solidly green water, which is a, a different scenario. Sometimes when it floats up to the surface, it can form actually like linear lines on the surface of the water, even parallel lines or swirly windrow type formations. So this is just an example of that. And then other like docks, pions, other materials on shore will cause it to get trapped and accumulate. And this is a scenario where it's sort of dying and decaying. So it turns that brown or white blue color. And here the, the cells are probably dying and, and releasing what's inside of them. So these types of blooms can actually be much more toxic than those out in the open water with healthier cells. So here you can see how it's you know, accumulating right on the shoreline where you might be recreating, but out in the open water, it's quite blue and, and maybe not an issue. So this plays a role, again, how we talk to the public about it, because, you know, we can never close a water body. That is not a function of state government. We can only close beaches, regulated swimming areas. But we can advise people, you don't want to, maybe don't swim where it's green, but if you go out on your boat to the open water and it looks blue and clear, there's a low likelihood that you'll encounter health effects out where you don't see green water. So just because there's a hab in one place on shore doesn't mean the entire water body is impacted or certainly not, doesn't mean it's off limits. Sometimes, particularly in calm water conditions, it can form sort of clumps, but these are not solid. Like you can't pick them up. If you poke these with a paddle, or something, they'll just break into pieces. There's no substance to them, but it is kind of a characteristic of HABs, um, again, floating up to the surface. All right, pop quiz. We're going to start on the upper left and go across each row, and I would like you to say yes or no. Is it a harmful algal bloom? Okay, first picture. Yeah. Yes, so it's mixed into the water. It's very green, pretty clear. Next. No. no. So there is clearly some kind of impairment water quality issue there, but it's not a harmful algal bloom. It's, there's something else going on. Next. Yeah, that's pretty classic. The swirling, the white, the green, pretty classic. Next. No. So there's some filamentous green algae and some emergent aquatic plants mixed together. Next. And you're hesitant. That's okay. This is, yes, um, this is the kind of parallel streaking that I was talking about which is caused when wind and uh, wave action pushes, pushes it on shore. Next, again, yeses and nos, and that's fine. 
This is sort of um, mezzi, like medium conditions. This is actually out in the middle of a finger lake, Honey Oil Lake, which has consistent low level halves all year round. And um, if we collected that sample, it would actually fall very close to our quantitative thresholds of what is a harm probable bloom. I'm just gonna pause it right here to highlight that maybe condition. Um, last year and the year before, we, we had a lot of those conditions here on Cayuga Lake, and you all did a very good job of just doing the right thing, whereby you collect the sample anyways, even though you might have a little bit of doubt. And I just want to stress that that is the right thing to do, um, because often when we get these maybe kind of sparse looking samples back to the lab, we end up discovering that they do have pretty high microcystin concentrations. Um, not very high, but you know, close to some of the limits that we talk about. And so that's really important data to collect. And actually, if you go to the DEC's website and you compare between 2018 and now, you'll notice that their quantitative thresholds for what they consider a bloom has changed. Um, and I believe part of that is uh, due to the research that groups like ourselves and groups on other lakes across New York are doing to capture these data. So. Always best to collect a sample if you're in doubt. Next. And you're hesitant again, and that's because this is a really crappy picture. It's out of focus, there's no context. This kind of picture is not enough to help us back in central office to evaluate a picture. So if you are submitting photos to us, please step back, make sure you can really see what's going on. This happens to be cyanobacteria bloom. Again, these are the kind of clumps that form that can be maybe the size of a penny or a walnut. But again, if you poke them, they would just disintegrate. Next. No. Correct. That's lily pads and some filamentous green algae. And the last one. Right. More green algae. Good job. Great. Yeah, so hopefully that was a nice refresher. Um, that video is also available on our HABS monitoring information page on our website. So you can always go back to it throughout the season if you want to refresh your idea of what a bloom looks like. Um, I'll just talk about our program a little bit. So our Cayuga Lake HAPS monitoring program started in 2018, and it was developed by the Community Science Institute, the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network, and Discover Cayuga Lake. Um, and we developed it in response to a lot of bloom reports being received in 2017, and a lot of community concern surrounding whether these blooms were increasing on the lake and what it meant for our communities. Um, so the purpose of the program is, is twofold. The primary purpose is to provide you know, accurate and fast information to serve as hazard warnings for everyone who uses Cayuga Lake. Um, and that's why we focus on reporting these blooms as quickly as possible. Um, and then the other purpose is to develop information about the occurrence of blooms that may be useful in risk management strategies um, or future monitoring to say, tell whether our water quality management actions are having an impact on how many blooms are occurring or not. So they serve these really important functions um, and it wouldn't be possible without you. So thank you. Uh, we have some great photos over the years of you know, planning and being out by the lake and monitoring blooms. So it's a wonderful community program. Uh, so this year, we are going to start our HABs monitoring season on the week of June 27th. Uh, so that's a, a couple days earlier than last year when we start on June 29th. Um, but that's in response to some early bloom reports that we received right around June 29th and July 4th last year. So we really want to make sure we're starting to get out there and keep an eye on the water conditions to, you know, watch out for any of those early season blooms. Um, so at that point, once the season starts, we ask that you just monitor your shoreline once per week until September 30th. And again, it's completely fine to miss a week here or there. Uh, just, you know, email in advance and that way we know what's going on with your zone. Um, so when you complete a survey, as you know, there's kind of two outcomes that result. Uh, if you don't see a suspicious bloom and it's a beautiful day out there. The water's you know, looking just perfect to swim in, nice sunny day. Um, we ask that you submit what's called a no bloom report. 
Um, and that's really important information because it's important to know when these blooms are not occurring, uh, just as it's equally important to know when they are occurring. Um, now, if you go out to survey your zone and you do see a suspicious bloom, uh, we ask that you report it right away, uh, either using the HABS hotline at gmail.com email address or on our report a HAB function on our website. Um, and then when you report a bloom, as you know, we also ask that you collect a sample of the suspicious bloom um, and help transport it on ice to CSI lab. So this is a quick picture of what the no bloom report looks like. Um, it should be filled out every time you survey your zone and do not observe a bloom. So again, what's that, what that is getting at is that you can survey your zone multiple times a week if you'd like. Uh, we just ask that if you do so, try and fill out a no bloom report every time that you do. Um, the link to this no bloom report can be found on our HABS monitoring information page. And I'll make sure to email that link out uh, in you know, some reminder emails the first few weeks of the season so that everyone can find it really easily. Now, I'll flip flop these pages. So when you report a suspicious bloom, uh, one of the tried and true ways of doing this is by emailing the Habs hotline at gmail.com. So that's a really great way to report a bloom. Um, very simple and straightforward, just saying that you observed a suspicious cyanobacteria bloom. Um, and then we just ask you to include some important information. So your monitoring zone number, um, the date and time that you observed it, and then the GPS coordinates and a location description. So here's a great example of a nicely reported suspicious bloom. Um, they've attached those pictures there with all of the information. Um, there's a close-up picture of the bloom showing its composition and then a nice uh, photo taken a bit further away so that we can see its extent on the shoreline. Um, alternatively, you can use our report a have function on our website. It will ask for all of the same information. Um, we're, you know, we're just testing it a little bit more, working out some kinks that it had last year um, that seemed to be related to the type of files that people were uploading. Um, it seems to only like to accept either JPEG or PNG files for the photos. So if it's anything other than that, sometimes it will um, kind of mess, mess with the report. Uh, but again, hopefully we can work that out. And as always, we have the tried and true method of just emailing us. So when you collect a sample of a suspicious bloom, uh, we ask that you do that as soon as you see the suspicious bloom um, or, or as soon as you can upon observing one. So it's always good to bring your sampling kit with you when you monitor your shoreline. You know, sometimes we'll get a picture of a suspicious bloom that's really dense like that one in the photo. And then the sample comes to the lab and it's, and it's very sparse. And we're trying to put two and two together and we realized that the bloom was sampled maybe one or two hours after the photo was taken, um, which is fine. Um, but it's, it's nice if the sample can be collected as, as soon as you see the bloom. Um, just a note to wear gloves like this person is doing in the photo. Uh, again, cyanobacteria produce these toxins. They also produce skin irritants that can cause things like rashes. Um, so it's always good to wear gloves. We've included gloves in every HAB sampling kit here. Um, but if you do get any of the bloom on you, just immediately wash it off with some, some clean water. Um, and again, as you know, uh, we ask that you collect the sample at the most dense point of the bloom. Um, so that provides kind of a worst case scenario in, in a sense, uh, if someone were to be exposed to it. Now, the test for the microcystin toxin has some really strict requirements. And one of those is that the sample is processed uh, here at the lab within 48 hours of collection. Um, so that's why we ask that you bring the sample to the lab the same day that you collect it or no later than the following day at 4 p.m. And we'll go into some options for dropping off those bloom samples. Um, 
I'll note here that not everyone has a HAB sampling kit left over from last year. So if you don't, uh, please make sure to pick up one of those sampling kits prior to the start of the bloom season. We have them available for pickup here at CSI Lab. And also uh, each of the four quadrant leaders has these sampling kits as well. Uh, so you can get in touch with your local quadrant leader if you don't wanna drive as far to pick up one of those. Uh, Bill, if, if you'd like to just talk about your sampling device really quickly here, I think a lot of people would be interested to hear about it. Okay, um, sure. Um, okay, uh, well, we, we've fabricated a, a sampling device uh, and, and what, it, what it amounts to is uh, it is a, yeah, I'm having a hard time working with that. It, it is a, uh, what's called a pipe clamp, but it, it's a special pipe clamp um, or strap wrench as, okay. And I don't know if you can see this, but it's, it's one made by Superior Tool and it's number 3613. I've been most successful finding it out in, uh, on eBay. So um, the, the, the difference between this and, and the normal strap clamp that you might buy at Harbor Freight is it's, it's got a, a cam here that holds the strap. It's not just friction that works fine if you're working with a, a pipe. But for this particular case, the, when you pull the strap tight around the bottle, as we've done here, the, this this cam keeps the strap tight so that so that 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 it won't come loose okay so um it works very well on the on the other end of it uh this is uh a i bought a an inexpensive purdy paint roller and cut the part cut it off at the stem here, okay, and just use the handle. And then I took two two inch hose clamps from an automotive store, Napa, whoever, and clamped it to the handle of the strap wrench. And now we can install the, uh, an extension pole on here and you can uh, get, get extension poles that go up to nine foot long. So that wouldn't be necessary, I'm sure, but um, it, it uh, allows you to take a sample. So, so many times uh, you're, you walk out on your dock and you realize you have a hab and it's 25 foot off of shore. And uh, the good dense part where you'd like to get uh, that sample for Nate and you can't reach it from the dock. And uh, you'd have to wade out into other uh, marginal waters to get that. So this allows you to reach off the dock and get that. And I found it handy for doing uh, two samples last year. So uh, um, Tom Cassell is going to make a YouTube of this little process. It'll be a little more explicit than what I just uh, did there. But uh, anyhow, it it's really works very nicely. And I'm sure uh, everybody, everybody would really enjoy one. So, OK, so that's it. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, thanks, Bill. That's a great, great invention to get out there and reach those, those hard to reach blooms. Um, I think, you know, as you said, it can really serve a lot of people with kind of some tricky shorelines and uh, maybe taller docks. Um, so uh, we will share that link for how to construct your own uh, sampling extension um, once the video is ready. So we'll provide that to everyone. Great. So as with every suspicious bloom, um, we ask that you just fill out the accompanying chain of custody. Um, it's a pretty simple process. It just asks for some important information, such as the GPS coordinates, the nearest address, 
the name who, of the person who collected the sample uh, and their contact information. And then really importantly down here, the chain of custody information. So just signing off on who uh, took, you know, dropped off the sample and whether it was refrigerated uh, or kept on ice. And that's really important just for us to know uh, in the lab when we're processing these samples. Now, I included this slide in here and I'll go over it just really quickly. Um, I thought that it might be nice to just highlight some good ways to find the GPS coordinates because I know that can be a little tricky. Um, so here are two ways that I really like. Uh, one works really nicely if you have a smartphone, like an iPhone, um, but I believe other types of smartphones have this application. Uh, there should be a compass app preloaded onto every phone. And when you click on it, um, it opens an application like this. Um, and right down here, it will list your uh, GPS coordinates in um, hours, minutes, and seconds. Um, and you know, just one note that if you have your location services turned off, those might not pop up. So you just have to check your settings uh, to make sure that that works. Um, another great way is just to use Google Maps. And this is nearly what I do for every uh, suspicious bloom report that we need to look up the coordinates for. Um, so you just open Google Maps and pan to your part of the lake and then double click on the spot that you, you know, estimate the bloom was located. And a little pop-up window will pop up at the bottom here and it'll show the GPS coordinates of that, that point that you clicked. And so that's a really great way to get exact locations as well. Um, the GPS coordinates are really important uh, because a lot of the lakeside roads around here, you know, are windy or they don't show up completely on a map or they're at the bottom or top of cliffs. So sometimes, you know, a mailing address doesn't, doesn't fully describe exactly where a bloom is. So as you know, Cayuga Lake is a really big lake um, and we're now monitoring nearly 60% of the shoreline. Here is a map here and the gray boxes are all of our monitoring zones. Um, so, it's a, it's a huge program to coordinate, uh, but luckily we have the help of our HABS leadership team. So that is our four quadrant leaders, um, one for each quadrant of the lake. Um, and Bill Ebert, who is our Northwest quadrant leader, who you just heard from is on the call today. And so is John Abel, who is our Southwest quadrant leader. Um, you know, these leaders are, really knowledgeable about every facet of the program um, and are here to help throughout the summer if you have any questions about uh, reporting a bloom or collecting a sample. So their information is there. Um, their information will also be in the monitoring information packet that I'll send out later today. Now you might be hearing from your quadrant leader or myself um, or the watershed network throughout the season if someone who is not part of the program reports a suspicious bloom. And this happens quite a bit actually that we get public reports. Um, so in that case, one of the members of our HABS leadership team here will look up uh, whichever volunteer has a monitoring zone closest to where this public person is reporting the bloom. Um, and then we reach out to that volunteer to see if they're available to go investigate the bloom. Um, so, you know, if you're not available that day, no problem, you know, we'll try and ask someone else. Uh, but if you are, it's, it's a great opportunity to, and it's really helpful for us to collect that sample. Um, but it's a great opportunity to also, you know, talk with some new people, uh, tell them about harmful algal blooms and just provide a little education that way. Um, getting permission, I think everyone here probably has permission to monitor their shoreline, whether it's your own or your neighbors. Uh, but if you are going to investigate a suspicious bloom report, uh, just make sure that you have permission from that person to walk on their shoreline. Um, and again, if you're willing to speak with them, it's a great opportunity to talk about the program. Uh, we have these HABs monitoring 
and reporting brochures. And so if you'd like copies of these, I'd be happy to mail them to you. Just send me an email. Um, and they're great to have on hand when you're you know, talking with your neighbors or the public about the program. So now that you've collected a sample, you know, you've seen a suspicious bloom, you've collected a sample, it needs to arrive again to CSI lab, um, either the same day it's collected or no later than 4 p.m. the following day. Um, and so we have a couple systems in place to make that happen. Our lab is located here on 95 Brown Road in Ithaca, um, and we're open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 p.m. So you can bring a sample by any time during those hours. Um, if you're going to come after 5 p.m. or before 9 o'clock or on the weekends, we do have an after hours drop off location. Um, it's this little structure behind the building and in it you'll find uh, a cooler to put your filled sample in and also a box of replacement kits uh, for you to take a, a fresh kit with you. Um, and that little structure will be all set and ready to go starting this weekend even. Hopefully we don't get any blooms, but it'll be there for the rest of the summer. Um, if you live in the northern part of the lake or a bit farther away from Ithaca, we do have a halfway drop-off system uh, that can be used as needed. Um, and so those are coolers that are run by our volunteers. Uh, one of our volunteers on the western side who lives in Ovid, and then a, our actually our northeast quadrant leader, Christy Van Arnhem, runs the drop-off system on the eastern side. And that one is located behind the fire department in Aurora. And those drop-off systems are just extra coolers that you can bring a sample to. And then the volunteers who run them are able to bring the sample the rest of the way to Ithaca because they work there. So once the sample arrives at the lab, we test it for uh, what type of cyanobacteria are present in the bloom sample, um, what the concentration of chlorophyll is as a measure of bloom density, and then really importantly, we determine the concentration of microcystin toxin. Um, now that's kind of a unique strength of Cayuga Lake's program because as of now, not many, uh, if any, bloom monitoring programs left in the state are able to test all of their bloom samples for microcystin toxin. So it's a really nice strength of our program. It provides our local officials with some really detailed and important information about the risk these blooms might present. Um, and so we're just, we're really happy that we can continue doing that. And all of these results will be updated on our HABS reporting page. And this can be found on our website. Um, as soon as you report a bloom, we try to get that report up onto our HABS reporting page as soon as possible. Um, and then we will update that report with our results from lab analyses um, as soon as they become available. So the reporting page is on our website. It looks like this uh, screenshot over here. It has an interactive map where you can click on one of the bloom icons and all of its information will pop up, such as the photos that you took. Um, it, will, it also shows all of the monitoring zones. So if you ever have any question about what your zone number is um, or who's monitoring where, you can click on one of those monitoring zones and the zone number will pop up. Um, all of the data that we collect here on Cayuga Lake is then submitted to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and they report it on their statewide NIHABS reporting system. Um, so what you're doing is really important because it has a statewide audience. You know, people who maybe uh, have a summer cottage up here on Cayuga Lake or want to come vacation, but they want to make sure that harmful algal blooms um, aren't too severe right now. They are often checking this statewide map or even calling ourselves here at CSI. Um, so it definitely reaches a statewide audience. Uh, the Watershed Network also puts out weekly updates to the public throughout the summer months, and I would really encourage you to sign up for those if you haven't already. Um, it highlights some of the recent bloom occurrences and uh, highlights some great information about 
uh, recent water events and upcoming water related events. And so that's a really great resource uh, for everyone to stay tuned to. So last few things here. Um, if you're a new volunteer, we'll work with you to assign a monitoring zone. Um, again, the sampling kits will be available to pick up at the lab or at your uh, quadrant leader. So please be sure to pick up one of those kits prior to the start of the monitoring season. And then everything that we've covered today uh, will be able to be found on our HABS uh, information page on our website. And so um, you can go there to find a recording of this webinar, uh, the slides, uh, the HABS identification video, and a lot more. So it's a really great resource. Um, I'll also be sending out a link to the recording of the slides and our uh, monitoring program guide uh, later today, which covers everything in detail that we've talked about. So now I'd like to open it up to any questions that people have about monitoring uh, for the next five minutes, and then we will hand over the presentation to Jennifer Tofano. Any questions about the monitoring process? Yeah, Nate, you mentioned uh, somewhere in your uh, presentation that we had 48 hours to get the sample to your lab. And then in other parts, you're talking 24 hours. Is what, what uh, we could use some clarification there for weekend yeah. kind of things. For weekend kind of things. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I will change that. We kind of do the by no later than 4 p.m. the next day just to be a bit conservative, but it's true that the, the actual holding time is 48 hours. So that's the amount of time that we have essentially from when the sample is collected to when we need to process it here at the lab. Um, so 48 hours is, is the ultimate cutoff. Yeah, that's a good question. Kristen, it looks like you had a question. Yeah, so you said that you'd been uh, noticing different patterns emerging between the north and the south sides of the lake. And I wondered if you had taken any samples of the lake water between, I mean, any of the quadrants and analyzed that and kind of found that there's difficult or different chemical compositions, which, you know, is why that's happening, or I don't know if you guys have done anything like that. I can't imagine you wouldn't have, but. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and something that we're working on a little bit more, we have a long-term data set for the water quality of seven locations in the Southern end of Cayuga Lake, um, showing you know the phosphorus levels to be, uh, you know, right where you'd call kind of a mesotrophic lake. So not too high, but not extremely low phosphorus levels. Um, that data set goes back a number of years, almost 10 years now. Um, but we've, we lack data for water quality in the northern end of the lake. Um, just this past year, we started monitoring two locations in the northern end of the lake, the water quality up there, um, with in collaboration with the Cuga uh, Lake Environmental Action Now, um, so hopefully we can continue doing that and build that data set a little bit. That might help highlight any differences there might be in the water quality. Um, but certainly, you know, we have many, many stream monitoring volunteer groups, um, and they monitor streams uh, throughout the entire watershed, both northern and southern. And those data sets of water quality are getting really, really large and comprehensive. So those are also great for understanding some regional differences as well. Nate, I had a question that, which I put on chat. Um, if you spot a suspicious bloom outside of your zone, uh, what should you do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say report it and then sample it if you're able to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're not able to sample it uh, because maybe you're running an errand somewhere and you just happen to notice it or you're at a neighbor's house or something like that, um, still report it, you know, and we will figure out a way to, to get someone there to collect the sample. 
Yeah, but if you're out on the lake, um, uh, you're out of a zone number and you just give the coordinates and collect the sample if you're in a boat or something out there. Yeah, exactly. Yep, and then we'll just sign, assign a, a, a non uh, zone code or just a general lake code for that bloom. Okay. Yeah, Barbara. Um, couple questions. One is, um, I've been doing this the last couple of years and in the identification video, she identified those little clumps and several times I've seen where there are little clumps, maybe a quarter of an inch in diameter or less throughout the water column. Um, and the times that I did collect a sample, they were not considered a bloom. So if it's something like that, do you want us to go ahead and collect a sample? It's like, it may be a bloom, you know, yeah. later that day or tomorrow, but um, I was just, you know, do you want a sample if it's iffy? Um, it's, it can be a tough call. Um, and especially because I know it can, it can be, a, you know, kind of a big task to bring the sample all the way to Ithaca. Um, but I would say, you know, if in doubt, collect a sample. Um, and the, the laboratory analyses here will, you know, help us make a final determination about whether it's a bloom or not. Great, thank you. And then a very specific question regards to my zone, which is Stewart Park at the southern end of Cayuga Lake. There's that pond where last year it had all these green swirls most of the summer, but they weren't cyanobacteria. Do you want samples from that this year? Yeah, that's a good question. That pond is always blooming. Um, <laughs> And for it, we, you know, we'd love it if you report it, um, but, you know, we don't have to take any samples from there this year. Okay. Um, and, and part of the reason being is that it, it's not Cayuga Lake, right? So um, it's not kind of covered by the program in a sense. But okay. if you report it, then we can at least notify people and they can get some signs up. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All so right. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, um, do you care whether the um, latitude and longitude are in degrees, minutes, and seconds, or in decimal degrees? Oh, no preference. Yeah, either one works fine. And we'll just uh, translate it here at the lab. Yeah. There is a uh, app that I have on my, uh, my smartphone, which uh, was free to download. It's called Coordinates. And it does um, the same thing and gives you the option as to whether you want uh, the, uh, the uh, degrees in decimal or minutes, uh, degrees, minutes, seconds. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah, I can put that up on our slides here before I post them. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Well, I'm always here to help if you have any questions, so please don't hesitate to email or call. Um, but now I'll turn over the presentation to Jennifer Tofano, and she is going to be talking about lake-friendly living and ways that you can help protect the water quality of Cayuga Lake on your shoreline. Thank you, Nate. Thanks so much um, for letting us kind of piggyback on this uh, training here, and I recognize that I am the one thing between you all and a beautiful June afternoon. So I'll just take about five to 10 minutes uh, to tell you a little bit about Lake Friendly Living and how you can join um, and share this with others. I'm happy to see, actually, I'm seeing some of the names on the screen. Some of you are already part of the program. Uh, so this will be a bit of a refresher, but maybe also encourage you to take some next steps if you've just gotten started. So I'm going to head and I'm going to share my screen here. Are you able to see that, Nate? Perfect. Thank you. Great. 
So what I wanted to do was just start out by showing you the Cuyahoga Lake Watershed Network page and how you can access our lake friendly living information um, and sign up and take the pledge. In essence, the Lake Friendly Living Program is a homeowner based program that allows you to take very simple and practical steps to improve um, the water that is on your property. As we all know, it all ends up in the lake um, or stream eventually anyway. So what are some of the things that you all can do as Nate said in the very beginning to potentially you know, improve the water as it goes in and could have a positive impact on, uh, on the quality of, of Cayuga Lake and potentially reduce HABs. I don't wanna make that leap, but every little bit helps. Um, and since all of you are already involved in this program, which is so valuable, and we're so grateful to have worked with CSI over the years to develop this, um, and Nate specifically in the last few, that we thought these two programs um, uh, reflect one another and can, can build on the work you're already doing on the water to what you're going to do on your property. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more, I'm going to show you how to do that. On the Cuba Lake Watershed Network page, and I did include our website in the chat, you'll go to resources and then to Lake Friendly Living, which brings you to our lovely page here, has our lovely logo, and we're going to scroll down to show you what this page contains. Basically, it talks about stormwater runoff, it talks about water, and it talks about what happens when too much of too many bad things end up in the waterways, and then what you can do. And so Lake Friendly Living has adopted these 12 steps categorized in the three areas that you see here. So the first is minimizing runoff. The second is eliminating pollutants. And then the third is capturing and infiltrating water. And some of these things are, you know, they kind of build on each other. If you start with one, two, or three, you know, limiting your lawn size and using water wisely, looking at the surfaces on your property. You know, one of the things as lakeshore owners, um, and I know my parents deal with this, they're lakeside uh, livers, and one of them wants to mow the lawn right to the shoreline to keep it neat and tidy. And my other parent, wants to em embrace all the shorescaping and the natives and building up this beautiful barrier between their lawn and the lake. Um, different ways, you know, there may be some of those conversations happening in your own home, um, but these are great steps, you know, simple things that you can do um, that don't cost any money. Just take a little bit of time to look at maybe how you're using your shoreline, how water is running from your land into the water, um, could be as simple as even if you don't want to put plantings down on your shoreline, just let the grass grow a bit, you know, mow a little bit less. Um, the program is simple um, and involves um, three areas right here. So in a moment, I'm going to show you the Cayuga Lake Homeowner's Guide, which is also available on our website. We're going to review those 12 simple strategies and steps above and then decide which practices you are going to take and implement on your own property. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm going to show you the Cayuga Lake Homeowner's Guide briefly. Because as you looked at those 12 steps, you know, it's really an outline. And so if you wanna dig deeper and figure out what each of those means, this is the place you go. And you can see here, we have our 12 simple strategies. And if you scroll down a little bit further, you'll see again, those are those 12 that we just looked at before. And then if you continue down, you'll see how each of them is explained in greater detail and what it means in terms of those simple and practical steps that you can take as a homeowner. So it discusses stormwater runoff. I'm not gonna go through all of these because you can easily go here yourself, right? Reducing impermeable services, the idea. Limiting your lawn size, right? And so you can just scroll through this. This is a free resource. Enjoy it at your leisure. And we'll, um, we'll just um, illuminate a little bit more um, what the, uh, sorry, the, those, 12, those 12 steps. Okay, so back to our page. So you've read this, you're signing up, you're excited about it, you wanna take the pledge, okay? So we're on that same page on our website. We're gonna take the pledge. We're gonna click here. And what it takes you to is this simple 
sign up area. Now, the Lake Valley Living Program is very personal. It's not something we're going to track. It's not something you need to report on. It's something internally that you've decided on your own property that you want to take and do. And so it just shows you those things that you are agreeing to um, and that you're affirming on your own. You'll fill out your name, some information, asking me if we can post your name on our Lake Friendly Living Pledge page, which we love to do. You're welcome to remain anonymous. And then allows you options of receiving our Lake Friendly Living updates and or information on becoming a Q Lake Watershed Network member. You take the pledge and then we send you a lovely uh, thank you letter. We send you a sticker, it's about this big with the logo on it uh, that you can affix to your car. You can put it on a, um, a window in your home. And we have these super schnazzy weatherproof signs that we can also send to you. All of this, the whole program's free of charge. I feel like an infomercial, but it's really not. Um, we just love, we just love it. Um, and these signs are, are um, available to you. You can affix them to a metal stake or a wooden stake, put them in your yard, somewhere on your property to show others that you have agreed to take this pledge and are committing to making um, water positive choices on your property. I wanted to just share one other piece of information. The Cube Lake Watershed Network is one of several Finger Lakes who are promoting this Lake Friendly Living program. And to that end, I wanted to share the Finger Lakes Regional Watershed Alliance webpage, which is hosting this Lake Friendly Living Coalition group of lakes. There are seven of us who recently held a week of seminars. I know many of you participated in those webinars. So thank you for doing that. Um, and as a follow-up, the Finger Lakes Regional Watershed Alliance is hosting all of those presentations on their website. They're all in one spot. You can access them at any time. You can see the seven lake logos here and who participated. Thank you for joining us. And if you scroll down a little bit on their website, you can see here, watch recording, watch recording, and all of the presentations are available here. Um, so if you're interested in anything from hemlock woolly adelgid to native plantings, to shorescaping, to aquatic invasive species, sustainable vineyards, it's all here, enjoy it. Um, and um, you know, share it with your friends. Um, we're excited to, to be telling you about this. Um, we're excited to have you participate and welcome, welcome all of you to do that um, and share it with your friends. So I'm going to actually stop sharing now and invite um, any questions. If any of you are participants and you have questions about continuing in the program, signing up to begin with, anything about any of the, the tenants that we kind of went through. I know it was quick, but you, have, you can look at, at, uh, at it all in more detail on your own. Does anyone have any questions? On? Yeah, thanks for that uh, very stimulating presentation. I liked it. Um, <laughs> okay. Sort of a technical question. What is the difference in terms of rain infiltration between grass and, and say, natural forest in Tompkins County? Is there sort of a ballpark uh, percentage difference between the two? And I'm guessing, you know, I'm, I'm thinking broadly forest as opposed to just, you know, gr uh, pasture grass or lawn grass. Are you talking about percentages as they currently exist? of each of those? Yeah, just if people have measured, because uh, you know, I, I own some forest land, I own some, some pasture land that I mow once a year, and I'm just thinking, wow, maybe I need to plant a lot more trees if, uh, if the infiltration rates are dramatically better for forest, or you know, maybe forests are 10% better. I don't know, do you wow. have some ballpark figures for us? I certainly don't, but I'm now very curious about that myself. And so let me get some information and I'm happy to share it out via Nate to you guys or to you personally, John. Um, okay. That is really, and, and we've not explored that as part of our group. It, does it, I don't know if anyone else on this call has information on that, please feel free to offer. Is anyone in that field or knows? I would also like to hear about it. Okay, all right, <laughs> you got it, Linda. Yeah, all right, we will find out. 
I think uh, David Weinstein, who's the um, on the Hugo Lake Watershed Network Climate Committee, might have information about that. He's a forestry expert, and uh, but uh, I mean, we know that there is a difference, but we don't. I don't think many of us know offhand quantitatively yeah. how we can relate it. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thanks, John and John. Yeah, I, I think uh, oh. that's the place to go, Jen, for the information, I think. Great. I'll um, get his contact information from you after then. Yeah, OK. I um, uh, I guess like to add the point that uh, every item on the uh, Lake Friendly Living uh, has a, um, a, a meaning and a, and a consequence related to climate change. And right now, climate change is one of the uh, uh, primary concerns in the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network strategic plan. And um, there is a separate booklet available on the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network, which actually relates each of these items to uh, uh, the changing climate challenges that we have the, on the lake. A wealth of information there. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks. Andy, did you have a question? I was just going to conjecture that uh, forests probably sequester a good bit more carbon. So that's, there may be some trade off there. I don't know that, but I guess it. Nice. Seems intuitive. Yes. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, Nate, thank you again very much for letting us be a part of the training today. Appreciate it. Great. Well, thank you. Those are, you know, really important actions that you can take as as homeowners. And you know, I think it all matters, um, and it all contributes to addressing the problem of harmful algal blooms. So. Thank you for attending today. Um, I'm really looking forward to another summer of monitoring blooms on Cayuga Lake. Um, and again, you know, we are, we're here for, to support you and to answer any questions you have. So feel free to always give us a call or send us an email uh, throughout the season. Thanks everyone. Nate, can I just ask a real quick question? Of course. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute. Okay, sorry. Um, is there going to be the conference that was that was held a couple of years ago, the HAP conference over in Geneva? I know it was postponed last year. It seemed like a state. It was the first time I'd attended something like that, so I don't know all the particulars, but it seemed like a statewide con conference. Yeah, that HAPS conference is really fun to go to each year. Um, they didn't have it last year because of COVID. Uh, it usually happens like in the winter or the early spring. Um, so I'm not sure if it's going to happen this year, but I can email someone and, and let you know. Thanks. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. Sorry, my internet kept going out, so I'm, I keep missing the best parts. Um, where... Are, where would one find, um, not necessarily a set of rules, but a set of guidelines if you own a business that's close to a body of water, um, just concerning like the amount of runoff or, you know, if they've got a drain system and let's say it's a hotel. Um, I have had my eye on a particular body of water that I've watched change for like the past year or two. And there's just no, it just it looks completely destroyed and I'm pretty, I'm almost positive it's an algal bloom, but I wonder, does the lab support other samples that aren't in the lake, the Cuga Lake watershed? Um, I don't know if like you guys have the ability to test anything else and I don't know if anything could come of it. It's just sad to see, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think it's a direct cause of what's, you know, what's being, deposited into there, whether it's chemicals or just runoff from the rain or, you know, the parking lot that's right there and all the chemicals from the car, like whatever it is, there's something going on there. And I just, I don't know. I feel like I want to do something about it. Yeah. 
No, that's a great question. Um, so a couple of resources, and I can certainly email you afterwards. Um, but you know, the EPA, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, both great to check out just for general information on what point sources are allowed to uh, outflow. Um, point sources in New York State are regulated by what's called a speedies permit. Um, so that's a state pollution elimination discharge permit. And so it gives essentially a point source a budget for how much phosphorus or E. coli or things like that they can output. Um, so that's a good thing to check if, if there's, you know, you think there might be a specific polluter. Um, all of those species permits are publicly posted. Um, so you can check that. Um, county soil and water conservation districts also have their eye very close on this and all of those ongoings. Um, and they can be great resources, although they are very busy a lot of the time, so they can be hard to reach, but they can be great resources about uh, kind of different water and soil management that's going on in the county um, and different permits and things like that. Um, as, as far as testing samples, um, for blooms, we're kind of limited to Cayuga Lake, um, but if you wanna test the water for things like nutrients or other things like that, um, yeah, we can certainly talk about that. We might be able to accommodate that. May I had a question. Um, yeah. I'm on, I'm on the waterfront and we had our stairs redone and there's, you know, I think that it was the invasive species basically holding the bank back. And, you know, what, how does that play a part in this? Because I worry about, I worry about keeping the bank together and yet the invasive species are taking over anything I've tried to put in, put on the hill. Yeah, that's a great question. Invasives can be hard to deal with. Um, and Jen or anyone else, please add on where I leave off here. Um, but, you know, in, in that sense, it sounds like the invasives were kind of serving a nice function to stop erosion. Um, so it's a toss up. You know, we want to keep after those invasives, um, but sometimes they can import, uh, serve some important functions. So I would say as much as you're able, you know, just try and remove and replace. So remove the invasives and replace with native species. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I will add to that. That's perfect, Nate, is that you may find some value in a couple of the programs that were part of the Lake Family Living Awareness Week. Uh, Camille Marcotte did a specific program on shorescaping and discussed exactly the issue that you are describing and talked about that replacing over time um, the fact that native species develop such a deeper and richer root system that over time do a much better job of um, keeping soil back than those invasives did. As much as they did what they did, natives operate on an even better and deeper level. And Camille provides all sorts of resources um, to do that, as well as Dan Siegel of the Plantsmen who presented uh, specifically about lakeshore plantings and, and what can be seen um, as valuable there as well. So if you go right to that Finger Lakes Regional Watershed Alliance page, you can, um, you can access both of the webinars there that again, do contain resources, but they, yeah, that's a big, it's a big issue, um, but one that can over time, um, you can definitely see some improvements. There's hope there. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right. I think we'll end it there. Thanks, everyone. Hope you have a great weekend. Thank you, Nate.